Hello, AP Statistics community. My name is Luke Wilcox. I'm an AP Statistics teacher at East Kentwood High School in Kentwood, Michigan. And I'm very excited today to share with you the StatsMedic Desmos project. Now, the primary question that we were trying to answer with this project is as we move past the pandemic and we move back into classrooms in person with students, what role does Desmos play specifically in the AP Statistics classroom? Now, in order to answer this question, we wanted to assemble a team of the best Desmos creators in the country. So we looked everywhere across the country, everywhere across the internet, and we came up with what I like to call the dream team. So here are the top 12 Desmos creators in the country with such notable names as Bob Lochelle, Lee Nataro, Juan Gomez, and Nate Novotny. So we got together through a couple of Zoom meetings and we had some big brainstorms about how we can best use Desmos in the AP Statistics classroom. And after a lot of discussion, we arrived at a goal for this project, which is to provide teachers with a library of Desmos activities that can be used to enhance instruction and improve student understanding. Now notice what you don't see here is that we are not trying to replace your instruction with technology. We do not believe that technology should be the primary source of instruction. We really believe that students should be working together collaboratively with the support of the teacher as your primary model of instruction, but then we can use Desmos to supplement that instruction. Now we did arrive at some guiding principles that would help us as we were creating these activities. So the first is that these activities are designed to be dropped into an already existing curriculum. So you don't necessarily have to change what you're doing. You can just add in some of these Desmos activities. Next, we wanted to make sure that we were leveraging the technology here such that the activity is somehow better with Desmos than it is as a paper and pencil version. We didn't wanna be utilizing technology just for the sake of utilizing technology, we wanted to make sure that it was actually better. Next, we wanted to make sure that the activities are going to focus on a specific set of content or skills. So this is gonna help you as the teacher to decide which activities you can use and where they fit in your curriculum. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that we had activities that vary in length. We know that we have teachers in lots and lots of different teaching schedules with different number of minutes per class. And so we wanted to offer a variety of lengths of activities so that you could make those decisions about how they fit in your own classroom. So here's a general overview of what we are hoping to put together over the summer here. And this is just a guideline, but you can see here that it is organized by the College Board CED unit. And you'll also notice that we have different number of activities for each unit, depending on the specific content of that unit. But in the end, by the end of the summer, uh, we're hoping to have about 50 Desmos activities for you to be able to use in your classroom. So we want you to be able to get an idea of what these activities look like. So we're gonna have Lee Nataro and Bob Lachelle take you through some activities from unit one. Hello, my name is Lee Natero, and I teach introductory statistics at Moravian University. If you have any questions about this activity, feel free to reach out to me at leenatero at gmail.com. So first of all, for those of you that have never experienced a polygraph, you might be wondering, what is a Desmos polygraph? So a Desmos polygraph is a two-player game where one person picks one of the 16 items, and then the player that they're going against has to ask yes or no questions to discover what was picked. And there are two main ways you could use this with your students. One is to review vocabulary, but the other way you could use it is to create a need for the vocabulary. I've done this with my students where we have not uh, learned all the vocabulary words that would be useful for a specific polygraph activity. And I have them play the activity and they struggle because they don't know the words to describe what they're seeing. And so that creates a need for the vocabulary. The first time that you do this, I recommend that you model this activity with your students. 
Maybe you play the game against your students and the students ask the questions of you, the yes or no questions of you um, to help them eliminate which of the items you chose. And my recommendation for a best practice is to have a pair of students work together and play against another pair of students. I've experienced this in my classroom where my students will ask better questions and they're more likely to not give up when they're working with a partner. So what does po a polygraph look like? Well, first of all, when students enter polygraph, they get this activity where the computer has chosen one of 16 students and there's some yes or no questions that are being asked, like, is your person wearing a long sleeved shirt? And the answer was yes. So all those, the uh, students that were not wearing long sleeve shirts were eliminated. And then we can see the next question was, is your person wearing glasses? And the answer to that was yes. So all the students that were not wearing glasses were eliminated. And now we've eliminated all the students without a polka dotted shirt. And then the final question was, is your person waving? And the answer is no. And this is how the student can then figure out what the particular card was that was chosen. So let's take a look at how this actually works in the Desmos polygraph activity called describing distributions. So here you can see I've logged on to my account at teacher.desmos.com. And the activity that I'm gonna be taking a look at in the Stats Medic Unit 1 collection is polygraph describing distributions. And so if I was using this with my students, I would click down here either to assign to a class or assign a single session code. So that's how you would create the invitation code. And then you would give this particular code to your students. You can copy that link and paste it into an email or on a web page or into your favorite learning management system. But let's take a look at a game that um, I've already played with some students and see what types of questions they asked. So you can actually go back and review these games with your students the next day. So let's take a look here at the game that was played by David Blackwell and Pierre de Fermat. Notice that I have these anonymized here by clicking on this button over here on the left, I anonymized my students. So we can go through this game as a class if we want to later on without um, calling undue attention to certain students that would rather not be called out. Um, maybe they don't wanna be seen as the smart brain student in the class, or maybe you wanna call out some questions that weren't such great questions and you want to recognize the importance of learning from mistakes without making a particular student feel bad. So here's the questions that were asked. First of all, is it a histogram? And actually in my classroom, I would ban the words histogram and box plot from this activity. So is this a histogram? Great question if you don't ban that word because you can eliminate half of the items. And then is the range from zero to five? The answer was no. So there were some other histograms and box plots that may have been eliminated because of that. Is there an outlier? The answer was yes. So eliminating any that did not have an outlier. Is the plot symmetric is another great question. Is the outlier above the bulk of the data? And is there more than one outlier? Um, notice that there are some questions here that um, maybe games didn't get finished or you could take a look and see you know, what the error was. Is your distribution a bar graph? They said yes, and they actually eliminated all the histograms in this particular problem. So one of the other things that you may be wondering is how did I actually create these uh, plots that are here. So if you take a look, this particular plot, I have the box plot and the histogram displayed together. This is a 23 element list. And so I'm doing a box plot on list A. And the way I made it so that the box plot was lower, I made the offset here negative four. So that's how you could create a box plot and a histogram on the same uh, graph screen. Um, and you'll notice that these numbers here are a little bit larger. The way I got those numbers to appear is I had the ordered pair 
but I hid the actual point and I substituted a label there. And then to make the label large enough, you can change the size of the label. Um, one other one that I created here was for a normal distribution. And so notice this one, I chose to create a normal distribution with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of three. And there were 200 values that were randomly selected from that normal distribution with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of three. And you might say, well, you know what? I don't want this histogram to have a bin width of one. I'd rather have it have a bin width of three. You can do that and make that a three. And then Zoom Fit allows that to fit on your screen a little bit better. So once again, if you have any questions, my name is Lena Taro, and I'd be glad to help you out with any of the new activities that we're creating for Desmos and StatsMedic. Hello, everybody. My name is Bob Lochel, and I'm very excited to be part of the StatsMedic Desmos activity team. And what I would like to do today is share with you um, what the collection looks like from a teacher perspective and some ideas about how you might use these activities in your classroom. So when you get the link from StatsMedic, uh, this is what the collection will look like. And the first thing you might notice is that the collection is organized by the College Board Course and Exam Description for AP Statistics, the CED. And right now, the team is hard at work finishing up Unit 1, which is exploring one variable data. Eventually, there will be nine activities here. It's just about done. And eventually, we'll start putting in two variable data and Unit 3, and you see this will run the entire uh, course description. And we're very excited to share this with you. And what I want to do today is share with you two activities that I've been working on and walk you through some of the uh, thought process behind them. So I'm going to share with you two activities, Understanding Standard Deviation and Comparing Distributions Review. Let's bring those up here. So first of all, Understanding Standard Deviation. So when you click on any of the activities, um, you'll see a front page that looks like this. It will give you a description of the activity. So in this activity, uh, let's unclick that, there we go. In this activity, students compare quantitative data sets by their variability and interpret standard deviation. Certainly interpreting standard deviation, understanding variability, very much a big idea within unit one for AP statistics. The CED alignment, the specific topics that this is meant to uh, cover are listed, and an estimated time is given, 15 to 20 minutes. And you'll notice that most of the activities, as you scroll down and look at the preview, are about five to eight screens. They are not long excursions. I would say a typical time you're going to find is 20 to 30 minutes on these activities depending on whether you decide to do them in class or as a review and come back later. There's different ways to use these. Uh, so let's take a look at a few of the screens here. I'm in the student preview right now. So if I click on one of the screens here, uh, first of all, this one just says, which of the four dot plots shown here represents the data set with the lowest standard deviation? Something very important for students to be able to identify is variability within data sets and use standard deviation as a measure for that lower standard deviation, uh, definitely that's D here, but then I'm asked to explain my thinking. Uh, this one has the least uh, variability, variability, okay? And I'm gonna share that with the class. And now you have some choices here at this point as a teacher. You can decide um, to give students individual feedback. If you are new to the Desmos game, I encourage you to try some of the Desmos webinars that walk you through how to work the teacher dashboard, but you can provide individual student feedback. Or you could even snapshot student thinking and share with the class and try to leverage what students say as part of a whole class discussion. So there's a lot of opportunity here to use student responses in a meaningful way. So this one has the least variability. So what's next here? Which of the four dot plots has the highest standard deviation? Um, so let's get this one wrong intentionally here. Let's say I think it's A. Um, so I think this one has SCADs of variability, which I cannot spell. SCADs of variability, variability. And I share that with the class. So I've done the lowest and the highest standard deviation. On the next screen now, it tells me if I've gotten this right or wrong. This is a self-checking activity. The set with the lowest standard deviation is D, but it's gonna let me know that in the last screen, the one with the highest standard deviation is B, because B has the most amount of variability. And to back that up now, I'm being given the standard deviations, the actual numerical value uh, of the standard deviation for sets B and D, and the challenge is for me to estimate the standard deviation of A and D knowing that lower standard deviations imply less variable data sets, higher standard deviations, more spread out. So it's a good chance to practice this topic. And eventually on screen six, we get to the idea of a contextual example here. Here are temperatures in California. 
And there's a quote here, over 40 days, Lahala saw a mean temperature of 70.7 with a standard deviation of six, provide a sentence description of what that number means. Something very specific that students are asked to do, think about standard deviation as a typical distance. And if you're new to the Desmos game, if you look at the preview here, on most screens, you're gonna find teacher moves, things that you can expect or to think about, to talk about with students. Uh, for example, in this one, encourage students to express standard deviation as typical distance from the mean and to express their ideas in context. So all along the way, we have you covered with things that experienced uh, statistics teachers have seen from their own students, and we hope you're able to use with yours. So that's a standard deviation activity. I also have one here on comparing distributions. Pretty typical thing that students are asked to do. Here are lengths of baseball games from two different years, 1975 and 2015. Compare the distributions. I'm not gonna type this whole paragraph, but this would be a wonderful time to snapshot student thinking, share them on the screen, ask students if they can self-reflect and self-identify um, works that are essentially correct, that seem to, to touch on everything, versus those that have some actionable feedback that students can provide. But along with that, on the next couple screens here, I now ask students here to evaluate statements for their correctness. Which of these are acceptable statements for comparing the centers? So I've given four things here. So for example, this one says the standard deviation. Well, we know that that's not something we use to compare center with. How about, I oh, want this one. The median game length in 2015 was about 170 minutes, while the median game length in 1975 was about 155 minutes. I'm gonna click that one. Let's see what happens when I check my work. It's gonna let me know here and give me some feedback that the word while is generally not accepted as a term for comparison. And isn't that one of those things that students often do in Unit 1 and AP Statistics? So here's a chance right away to challenge student thinking uh, and, and to provide uh, good examples of student work here. So they're asked to do this with centers and then eventually with spread, clustering versus variable versus the range. And then uh, this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, both dist distributions are roughly symmetric and they both have an outlier versus approximately normal. Can we use box plots and the statement approximately normal? And this will be a, a quick discussion of that. Lena Taro also has a wonderful activity within the collection that will challenge student thinking about box plots as a vessel for thinking about approximately normal distributions and how that often provides a conflict. Um, and then we have a one last screen where students are asked to sketch their thinking. So again, six screens and there are teacher moves throughout. If I go through each one, you can see student, oh, I lost my suggestions, and suggestions about how you might want to pace out the activity. So that's just an example of two of the many activities that you will see within the uh, collection, and we hope you find use in them. So now that you've seen a couple of these activities in practice, let's talk about where they can best be utilized in your classroom. So here are just a couple of ideas to consider. First, you could use the Desmos activity as a warm-up activity at the beginning of a class period, maybe to introduce a new concept or skill that you'll be talking about in that day's lesson. Next, you could definitely use this uh, in class as a practice after you have taught a new lesson. Certainly, this could be used with students that are absent that you uh, would want to be working on something uh, at home. And similarly, if you have students that are struggling that maybe even were in class, but need some additional support. Next, if you know you are going to be gone, maybe going to a math conference for the day, and you are working on sub plans, a Desmos activity can be a great activity for a sub because it can still be very productive even if you are not present. And then finally, these Desmos activities can definitely be used as reviews before an assessment. So where can you find all of these awesome Desmos activities? Uh, they are in production right now, but when they are complete, you will be able to find those at www.statsmedic.com slash Desmos. So we certainly hope that uh, this is going to be helpful for you and your classroom. Please enjoy the rest of your summer and hope you have a great school year next year. Thanks.